good to see all of you this morning. It is so good to be here. Uh, I just got back from junior high camp, had a very awesome, loud week, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, we had three teens go and uh, just had a, had a great week. So thank you for your prayers. Senior high camp is next week, so I'm headed back down there on Monday. So be in prayer, mostly for me, but also for the senior hires. Um, but just kidding. I am really looking forward. We have nine people going to senior high camp, including a girl who just came to our church Wednesday before last for the first time. So just be in prayer for that. I'm, ex I'm very excited uh, for what God's doing in, in, through camp and in the heart of that, that one person as well. So just be praying. Um, would you stand with us? I know there's a lot going on with us uh, in this world, but we need to proclaim this morning that God is the one who reigns, right? So let's sing together. <laughs> Let the earth and heavens rejoice, for the Lord our God reigns. Every child of God lift your voice, for the Lord our God reigns. Jesus Emmanuel, he has set us free. Every heart be filled with his life, for the Lord our God reigns. All the hopeless dance with delight, for the Lord our God reigns. Jesus Emmanuel, he has set us free. Hopeless souls redeemed to tell, for the Lord our God reigns. such great words. Sometimes those fast songs, you miss the words, you know. Jesus, Emmanuel, he has set us free. Hopeless souls redeemed to tell, for the Lord our God reigns. Does my life proclaim to the world that our Lord and God reigns? It's convicting, isn't it? Well, let's sing. This is House of the Lord. We worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And he won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross. Then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And he won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. We were the beggars. Now 
we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise.
moving when you move you make my heart pound when you fill the room you're here and i know you are moving i'm here and i know you will fill me pray together real quick before we sing this next song. Lord, oh, life can go so quickly, Lord, and sometimes uh, our service can go quickly, Lord, and we, we sing these songs and, and we don't even sometimes take the time to connect with them, Lord. So this morning as we sing this next song about making room for you, Lord, we want to make room for you in our heart and in our mind. Lord, help us to put down Whatever it is that we've been thinking about this morning, whatever's happened this last week, whatever may be happening today or, or in the week to come in our to-do lists, and help us to just put all that stuff down, Lord, and just focus all our hearts, all our minds on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Every burden, every crown This is my surrender This is my surrender Here is where I lay it down Every lie and every doubt This is my surrender And I will make room Whatever you want to, and I will make room for you, to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to.
prayer today. If you would like to remain standing, you are welcome to do so. If you would like to have a seat, you are welcome to do that as well. And as always, our altar is open if you would like to come up and kneel and have that quiet time with him also. So let us bow our heads, quiet our hearts, and go before him. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, that you are a loving Father, that you are a Father who is slow to anger, who is faithful, who will not forsake us, Lord, that you are a Heavenly Father who loves us so much that you give of yourself for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we today bring before you all of those burdens that are on our hearts, all of those worries, all of the concerns all of our joys and thankfulness, Lord. We bring before you all of that, and we surrender it to you. We bring it to you, and we lay it at your feet, Lord, and we give it to you, trusting you with it, that you will do what is best, that you will be with us in the midst of waiting for that answered prayer, and your Heavenly Father, that you are loving, and that your hand will be with us in the midst of those situations. And your Heavenly Father, we also want to thank you today for our fathers. Thank you for our fathers who are loving as you are loving, who have guided us, who have influenced us, Lord, towards you. Lord, we also pray for the fathers who have fallen short of that, who have maybe disappointed or frustrated or hurt, Lord. We pray for them, and we ask for your healing hand upon them, that you can restore them to you, that you can help them, Lord, to be able to find you and to rely on you and stand fast before you. And your Heavenly Father, we thank you for those father figures in our lives, Lord, those men who have lived out your character around us, who have pointed us to you, Lord, whether it's in work situations or in fun events that we take place in, Lord, or it is simply throughout the issues of our life. We thank you for them as well, Lord, that they are able to show you to us in the times that we desperately need it. And your Heavenly Father, we ask that you go with us, each one of us, Lord, that we can show your character to those around us as well, that we can live out your, your peace, your strength, your joy, Lord, that we can help people to see you in the midst of our words and our actions. Help us to be a people, Lord, who live you to those we are around. Please be with us, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to be drawn close to you, Lord. Help us to learn from you and help us to have the strength, the power, and the courage, Lord, to live that out in our lives in every situation that we are in. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your loving hand in our lives. And we ask for your strength, Lord, as we go forth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Check that. There we go. Um, and, and I thought as we were singing, we're praying for the Spirit to come. We're praying for the wind and fire, calling out the wind and fire. And I got the sense that uh, those are very destructive things that can come into fire and wind. That was the idea of judgment. It's going to come. The wind and fire is going to come and, and burn up that in our life, which needs to be burned up. So what a prayer. Fire and wind come. Uh, don't always know that we understand what that means. Lord, is there anything in my life that needs to be removed? Come and remove it. Cleanse it. Purify it. What a great, great prayer. We're going to look at uh, second, uh, 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. It is uh, uh, Father's Day, so on the way out, we have some gifts for our fathers, and you can grab them on the way out. Some candy for you. And then um, it is also, I, I noticed that it was also Juneteenth today. Uh, holiday, federal holiday. It's celebrated tomorrow, but it celebrates the Emancipation Proclamation, well, the freeing of the slaves anyway, and so uh, certainly that's another great thing to celebrate. And so those are on the church calendar, are in the, in the U.S. calendar and the federal holiday list of calendar events, but, but in the church we focus a little bit different. We focus on the church calendar. Uh, holidays comes from the word holy days originally, and so our holy days are based on the church calendar in the church, so that is the primary things that we celebrate. And the church calendar, as we've talked about, goes through the life of Jesus, 
and uh, focuses uh, primarily on two aspects of the life of Jesus. His coming in the incarnation, God came in the flesh, born as a, as a baby, and we celebrate that during the season of Advent leading up to Christmas, Christmas, Epiphany, that season that goes through, uh, through January 6th, the celebration of Epiphany. That's, that's one season that the church calendar celebrates. The other uh, major event that the church calendar celebrates is uh, the, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, we celebrate that on, on, on Lenten season going up to Good Friday and to uh, Easter Sunday. And then uh, the 40 days following Easter Sunday when Jesus appeared to his disciples uh, finally by his ascension when he went up to, to uh, heaven to be with his father and the day of Pentecost which we celebrated a couple weeks ago uh, which is the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the believers which has signified the moving of the church the body of Christ became uh, no longer his body but became through the members and people of the church and we celebrate that and so uh, those are the two major events of the Christian calendar and then in between that after Pentecost uh, they have something called the church calendar has something called Strangely enough, ordinary times. <laughs> kind of seems weird. These are ordinary times. But, um, and so summer is ordinary times. Um, the, the, the liturgical color for ordinary times is green, and it, and it emphasizes growth. And we'll see that many of the scriptures that we'll read sometimes in that, during that season will certainly emphasize the time of growth. But I thought about that. I thought summer is ordinary time, but this summer is hardly anything ordinary, is it? These are extraordinary times, extraordinary summer. I mean, nothing ordinary about paying $5 for gas, right? That's never happened in my lifetime, $5 for gas. Nothing ordinary about 8% inflation. Uh, these are not ordinary times. Three trillion retirement dollars have been lost recently in the stock market. Um, this summer does not seem very ordinary. There are 25 cities that set heat records in the last couple weeks. It was 109 in Las Vegas. It was 114 in Phoenix. And then I heard the report, which I've never heard a report like this before, 2,000 cattle in Kansas died of heat exhaustion. Never heard that happen before. They've been in Kansas for a long time. How do 2,000 cows uh, die of heat exhaustion or whatever heat causing uh, their death? And then we have the January 6th hearing going on, which is really extraordinary. We have... Uh, the Michigan gubernatorial race, so the Republican Party, it's like chaos going on. These are crazy, extraordinary times, and it's extraordinary for a lot of us, too. I have two more funerals this week, Monday and Saturday. I just cannot believe, there are, it's, I'm going way past my personal uh, number of, of funerals that I've conducted in a year. It just seems like we have so many extraordinary things going on. And uh, we live in extraordinary times, uh, but we serve an extraordinary God. And the next few weeks, we are going to look at an ordinary man who faced extraordinary times. The ordinary man was Elijah. Now, you Bible students will say, wait a second, there was nothing ordinary about Elijah. Okay, I mean, or, uh, we know if you know the story of Elijah, Elijah was this guy who uh, was dressed in this, it wore these camel hair or garment of hair is what it's called. We don't know exactly what it is. And maybe just well, that he was very hairy. We don't know. But he was had this strange, wild appearance, leather belt around his waist. He, uh, he we imagine him crazy, wild eyed kind of guy. And and. Uh, and so he doesn't seem anything but ordinary, but the book of James says that he was ordinary. The book of James says he was just like us. He was human, just like us. So it wasn't necessarily his personality or his personal charisma or his attitude that made him so different. It was that he was a man of God, as it says over and over again in the stories about him. He was a man of God. And that's what we're called to be, people of God. That made him different. That made him uh, extraordinary. I remember years ago when I was a teenager, Tina Turner sang a song, We Don't Need Another Hero. Uh, we seem like we need a hero in extraordinary times to step up and do something, but 
But I don't think we need another hero. I think we need ordinary people who are men and women of God. We don't have to be special. We don't have to be particularly gifted in ways that the world would consider. We don't have to have a lot of money. We don't have to have a lot of personal influence, charisma. But we do need to be the people of God in extraordinary times. And that's what our world needs, doesn't it? In times when things seem to be a little crazy and everything seems to be falling off the rails, can we be the people of God? That's what this man Elijah was. So 1 Kings chapter 17, let's stand as we read. 1 Kings 17, we're going to read the first 16 verses. Now Elijah, the Tishbite from Tishba in Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, Except at my word. <laughs> Just think of that, saying that to the king, King Ahab. As the Lord God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except when I say so. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook. And I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and eat meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up, because there had, been not been, there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there, and I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called out, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. Surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. I only have a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then go back, make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family, for the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the Lord, uh, with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What a word. You may be seated. Hmm. What a word. Well, interesting that today being Juneteenth, it kind of uh, reminds me of the freedom that happened in the Israelites. And it kind of sets up the story to get an understanding of what's going on in, this, in the story here. So you remember the children of Israel were captives in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. They had grown prosperous there, but they had been slaves under Pharaoh. And through Moses and through the power of God, the plagues that would came upon Egypt, finally God loosened Pharaoh's grip on the people of Israel, the children of Israel, and they were able to escape the power of Pharaoh, cross the Red Sea, and they uh, were free. They, once they were free, they did what God called them to do. Once you're going to be free, you're going to go to a mountain and worship me, Mount Sinai, famous mountain that we talk about. They go to Mount Sinai. The children of Israel go there. Moses goes up and they see the power of God on that, descending on that mountain in glory. And Moses comes down with the covenant, the law, the Ten Commandments. And he comes down to them and he, and he says to the people, and the Lord says to the people through Moses, 
um, this important command. If you obey my covenants, if you keep my commands, then you will be my treasured possession. Uh, though the whole earth is mine, pretty important to understand. The whole earth is mine, God says, but you will be my treasured possession. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. If you keep my covenants, obey my commands. I've got this special calling for you. And so you are called to be the priest, the kingdom of priests. In other words, you are, you're called, what a priest does, a priest is the intermediary between God and the people. That's what a priest does. He is the one who brings them together. And so he brings God to the people through, through his word, through, through uh, serving, through, through what he does. He shows the world this is who God is. The priest had to live a certain quality of life because they were representatives of God and they were supposed to demonstrate to the world this is who God is. So the priest would do that to the people and he would bring God to the people. But the priest also had another function. The priest would bring the people to God. He would intercede uh, the people to God. He would bring the, 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 the sacrifices for the people to God. He would bring them before the Lord with all their needs and present them before the Lord so that they would receive blessing. And so the priest had that role in which they were, they were revealing God to people and bringing people to God. And that was what the Israelites were called to do. It's not just going to be the priest who function in that particular role, but it's going to be the whole nation is going to, you're all going to be priests. You are all going to be my treasured possession who is going to reveal to the world who I am. You're going to reveal to the world who I am. And so, and so God said, uh, if, 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 talk, took, told them at Mount Sinai, gave them a covenant. Here's how you're to live. And then he leads, Moses leads them through the desert. Eventually Joshua leads them into the promised land. And this is where you are going to set up. This is where you are going to display uh, who I am through the way you live. And the promised land, that little piece of land about the size of New Hampshire or so, not very big, not very large. Um, it, it, it's not particularly, it's not the, the best land in the world you would find. I, when I went to Israel, I was amazed at how dry it looked. About half of the, half of the land of Israel is, is pretty much close to a desert. That From May to September, they very seldom get any rain. So, I mean, it is not what you would call lush and uh, uh, great land when we consider other land. Uh, in 1942, I think, there was a place in Israel that set nearly a world record for how hot it got. It got 129 degrees. So, I mean, it, it can be very hot. And so the land is that particular land. I look at that land. You go visit Israel and you go, hmm. This is the, the, of all the land that God could chose, he puts them in this particular land. It's got a lot of diversity, mountains, and, but deserts. And, but then you realize in ancient times, especially, that piece of land was, the, was a major trade route connecting three continents, a land bridge connecting three continents together. If you were in Mesopotamia, one of the great empires, you would, and wanted to get to Africa or Egypt, you would go down through that land bridge. If you were over here in, in the Greek or Roman Empire, you would go through that land bridge. And so in Asia, it was just this, it was like an intersection, a major intersection. It was like a road. It wasn't much longer, bigger than a road, uh, wider than a road. And people would, would go through that. And so God, it seems, puts Israel right at the intersection of the world he says, I'm going to plant you right here, and you are going to show the world who I am. Not just by your teaching, primarily by how you live. You're going to live differently. And therefore, you need to keep my covenants. You need to keep my covenants so you can show the world how I live. Um, you, you, you're going to show the world how to respect property. Thou shalt not steal. You're going to show the world how to, res how to have respect for elders. Honor your father and mother. You're going to show the world how to have respect for marriage. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You're going to show the world how to have respect for life. Thou shalt not murder. You're going to show the world um, how to um, not allow your work to be everything of who you are because you're going to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. One day a week, you're going to stop. Because you do not just exist to be productive for some 
company or some business. You're not slaves anymore. When you were slaves, you worked 24-7. Now you're not slaves anymore, so one day a week you are going to make it a rule that you're going to stop because you are more than just a, a, a human doing. You're a human being, and you sit in the presence of God. So, so he's teaching these things. You do not exist just for work. And so over and over again, the Lord gives them this covenant. And, and some of those things in the covenant are, are, are ancient, and they have to do with stuff that the ancients deal with that we don't deal with today. And so it can be a little confusing. But, but basically, the heart of it is you are going to follow the way I call you to live uh, because the number one thing is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second command is Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what I want you to be. I want you to be people who have God at the center of your life and love your neighbor as yourself. And you're going to be that kind of people and you're going to demonstrate to the world who I am by the way you live. I didn't choose you because you were so numerous. I didn't choose you because you were so gifted. Uh, I didn't choose you because you were the strongest. Your power is not going to be found in your numbers. Your power is not going to be found in your great military. I mean, there were great military empires all around them, and that would come through. The, the battles would happen as people would come through. The uh, battle lines would meet in the intersection of the world, as you can imagine. They would meet on that. But that's not going to define you. You're not going to be defined by having strong militaries and great economies, and, and, and the power is not in that. What is going to define you is that you trust in me, that you are a people of God. That's it. Now, of course, as we do and as they did, we don't think that's enough. It sounds so good, but when you've got a Babylonian empire up there, or you've got another empire over there, Assyrians, and you've got other of these people, you've got Egypt down there with Pharaoh, and they came from Egypt, they came from Pharaoh, so they remember what it was like. They remember what Pharaoh was like. It was still impressed in their hearts. It was hard to get Egypt out of them. They got out of Egypt, but hard to get Egypt out of them. They remember that. Uh, so they would be afraid of those armies. They would, be, uh, they would be enamored by the glory and the power of Egypt. And so like they, we do and like they did, uh, we say, yeah, we can't trust in God. We've got we've to have our own security. And it's going to be in our power. We want a king. Because we see what kings can do. We see what Pharaoh did. And so we want a king like Pharaoh. We want someone to come. And what they're going to do as a king, they're going to unite us. They're going to build an army. They're going to draft an army. They're going to take our best sons away. And they're going to go fight battles. And they're going to build this standing army with this great military force. And we're going to trust in the king who's going to build us an economy, who's going to do everything we want him to do. You see, a king is, is like their own little idol. <laughs> um, I remember the, the song, uh, what is that song? Oh, I can't remember the name of it, but there's a line in which it said, oh, who would ever want to be king? Just a puppet on a string. Who would ever want to be king? I mean, that's what it is. We want a king that can do what we want him to do. And we want him to build this powerful because we don't want to trust in God. God said over and over again, you're trusting me. I'll take 300 fighting men and go against a great army and defeat it. But if you take 3 million and I'm not with you, then you're going to lose. But they didn't. And so they wanted a king to be like Pharaoh. And here in this story with Elijah, a new king has come to power. A new dynasty came with, the, with Omri, the father. But now we have this new king, uh, his son, King Ahab. And in many ways, King Ahab was exactly the kind of king they wanted. Um, but he was the very opposite kind of king that God wanted. And that is often the case. The kind of king we want is often not the kind of king that God wants. And the kind of king that they wanted was a guy like Ahab. And what Ahab did is Ahab was great at making political alliances. Oh, that's what they wanted. They were always wanting to do that. They were always wanting to trust in Egypt or somewhere else. And, and the prophets talk about them over and over again. So they, they always wanted to do that. They wanted to, to, to go make these political alliances. And that's what Ahab did. Ahab was great, man. If we make a political alliance with these people and these people and these people, we're going to be strong in numbers. We're going to have all these political alliances, and they're going to, they're going to protect us from someone that might attack us. Nothing wrong with political alliances, but it is when it gets you to compromise your faith 
in God, which it did. He made treaties, and he married the Sidonian princess, Jezebel, who brought with her a lot of baggage into the marriage. The baggage was all the idolatry and the Baal worship that she had. And so he married and made, made this trade treaties and built up the military. One thing he did, he went down to Jericho, which was a city that was destroyed. When Joshua came in, Jericho was the great fortress that protected the Holy Land, protected the Promised Land right, on the, right down by the Jordan River, and, and Jericho was there. And it was destroyed, never to be rebuilt again was what the prophecy was. But Ahab says, I'm going to go rebuild it again. I'm going to go rebuild it again. I'm going to rebuild a fortress. I'm going to rebuild a military army. That's going Because if we have Jericho, then we're going to be protected. If we can have this great military stronghold right here, then we'll be strong. And no one will be able to defeat us. And so he did that. Restored Jericho. He's doing exactly what the people want. He's getting economies building up. He's, he, he, he starts building things. He starts building places of worship, Baal and Asherah, the Canaanite gods. He builds shrines all over Israel to these gods. In Samaria, there's a, a temple built to the gods, to Baal. And so he is full out just saying, I'm making this great alliance and I'm bringing in this other god uh, it's going to help us. The Baal God is going to bring rain, bring fertility to us. And it's an only a matter of time until the whole country seems to begin to s serve Baal. And Jezebel goes out and starts killing the Lord's prophets. Yahweh's prophets, the Israel, the God of creation, the God of Israel. And we read that Ahab did more than evil than any other king in Israel's history. Just the kind of king they wanted, just the kind of king God didn't want. And so God sends the prophet Elijah. And Elijah is the first prophet in a series of prophets that arise in Israel. And the key thing of the prophets is they are coming to speak truth to power. Uh, the whole kingdom, the monarchy of Israel was a real disaster for the most part. God allowed it to happen and God used it and obviously through David we see the image of the, uh, of the Messiah there's this model and yet even David was tremendously flawed and all the, all the kings of the north were tremendously flawed and most of the kings of the south were tremendously flawed and, and here you have um, uh, the, these prophets are, are rise up to go to those kings and to speak truth to power. They will not give in. They will not be scared, frightened. They were going to speak truth to power. And so over a period of a few hundred years, extraordinary number of prophets, men and women, distinguished by their power and skill in which they were able to present the reality of God. They were able to speak and say, this is who God is to a world that was, to a, a country, a people that were continuing to have idols and be, uh, have their imaginations debased by idolatry and lose perspective of who God is, the prophets came and said, this is who God is. This is the holy God. This is the word of the Lord. And they spoke, spake, spoke truth to power they could not be bought or sold, and therefore they were most often completely outside of the establishment. Or even if they had some level inside the establishment, it didn't matter. They would speak truth to power anyway. Elijah is the one, the model for someone outside of the establishment. He comes out completely out of the, out of the blue. He comes out without any ties, without any political ties, without any power. He simply comes, and, he, and he's living out in the wilderness. He's living on... Uh, you know, the picture of John the Baptist, locust and wild honey. We don't know what Elijah necessarily was eating, but he was not eating the kind of diet that the people would in the fancy palaces. He was out uh, wearing camel's hair or some kind of garment cloth, rough, just, just totally. You, no one's going to tell Elijah how to, how to live or how to think. He is God's man, living off the land, living simply. He's not caught up in all the wealth. He's not been bought and sold. No one's going to scare him with greater taxes or they're going to do anything. He is not that. He is completely God's man. And he speaks to truth to power. No alliance except God. He appears on the scene and says a simple word that turns the whole country upside down. As the Lord God of Israel lives, whom I serve, 
There will neither be dew nor rain in the next years except when I say so. <laughs> Baal, the fertility god, Baal, the rainmaker god, that King Ahab brought along to help make Israel prosperous and fertile, to bless the people. And, and, and the people are no longer trusting in the Lord to bless them. Now they're trusting in Baal. Baal is their God, Elijah. Elijah's name means my God is Yahweh. My God is the God of Israel. That's who he was. And he comes out and says, Baal is not the source of rain. Baal is not the source of blessing. God is. And a drought comes to Israel. A drought year after year. There is no rain. And the message is that Baal is unreliable. Baal is not to be trusted. Who sends the rain? Where does blessing come from? Where does joy come from? It comes from God alone. And Baal is a counterfeit God. Timothy Keller wrote a book, Counterfeit Gods, and I like that book. He talks about idols and idolatry, and, and he makes some good points. He says, you know, well, first of all, an idol, is you, an idol is taking something created and worshiping it. That's what they did. They, they would create idols out of wood or stone or silver or whatever. And that's what it is. Anything in creation can be an idol. We take it and we, we worship it. It becomes the ultimate thing in us, for us. And that's what an idol is, is worshiping creation rather than the creator. God blesses us with so many good things in creation, but we will take those blessings and we will make them ultimate. That is the one thing that I need, that I have to have. I need this, I have to have this, and then if I have this, then my life is meaningful. It is, it is my idol. And so we can, we can do that with anything. And, and in our world, we do that. I mean, we see it so often. We look at uh, beauty, I, I, Keller talks about this beauty, how that beauty can be an idol. And that we, you know, we think, boy, if I just look a certain way, well, then I've got it made. Then I'm valuable. Then people will love me. And, and, and our world puts up a certain image of beauty, and if you don't fit into that image, then people feel less and feel insignificant. Beauty becomes this God. Or success, if I only achieve this, we look at other people and we see their success, and boy, if I could, if I could get that successful, if I could be that successful, then I, would, then I would feel good about myself. I just need that, or I need praise. If people would say these things about me. But it doesn't matter how many times they say about us, you know, we, we need it the next day, don't we? It doesn't matter how much success we have one day, the next day we need more. It doesn't fill our hearts because Augustine said our hearts have this eternal emptiness that can only be filled by the eternal God if only I could be the center of attention if only I could be loved by this person if only I could have that relationship and, and so we, we set up these things that I have to have this and this is the thing I need and it can even be the very best things of life we can, we can make an idol I mean uh, family has a new baby and we we love that child but but we can make our children our a god where our where they are our ultimate right interesting reading edwin friedman uh, is a system family therapist who is a very interesting guy he's passed away now but he wrote an interesting book called uh, failure of nerve one of the great books that, that i love the book it's a challenging book about leadership and many other ways. But he studies families. That's what he does, system family, system theory, system families, uh, things that go on. And he, he made an interesting quote. He said, the first universal law of children, for children is this. Children who are able to work through problems with the least amount of difficulty are those whose parents have made them the least important to their own salvation. And, and when we suddenly make our children the center of it all, it doesn't do us good and it doesn't do them good, what Friedman says. 
There's something that's destructive about making an idol. When we make a relationship an idol, it fails us because people are mortal, and people are human, and people fail us, and it will fail the other as well. When we make a desire an idol, when I, this becomes what I have to have, and it becomes an idol for us. Is there something you have to have, a desire that you say, Lord, I have to have this? Then it is an idol. We make something ultimate instead of God. God, the, the blesser of every good thing that we have, and we take the good things he have and we turn them into an idol versus allowing him to be the source because only he can fill our heart. Well, Elijah sees what's going on in Israel and he's just not going to play that game. He knows that Yahweh is God. And so, so he, 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 pronounced, he, he makes this proclamation that there's going to be no rain. We're going to show who's God. We're going to show how unreliable your gods are. And they're going to fail you. And they do, of course. And then um, God provides for him. Great story. Uh, in the middle of a drought, when there's a struggle with water, getting water and food, he says, go hide yourself. Elijah was not very popular, I'm sure, by, he's, we know eventually he was called a troublemaker by Ahab. So he's not very popular, so he says, okay, you want to go hide off in the, in the, uh, in the uh, Karith, Karith Ravine the, and, there, and go there, and there's a little brook there that's going to have water in the midst of a drought. There's a brook that's going to have water for you. There are going to be ravens come and feed you, bread and, bread and meat. Get to even, even get to eat meat in the middle of a drought. So... Um, that's great. God's providing. Um, God is showing him that you trust in me and I will provide for you. But then, um, then the brook dries up. <laughs> then the brook dries up. I mean, the God who can do anything, the brook dries up. I mean, over time, we can imagine that Elijah has grown to count on the Kareth Ravine for food and water. Day after day, he could count on the ravine and that brook, and then one day, the brook die, dries up, and the ravens don't show up. And God, what are you doing? But God is teaching Elijah a very important lesson. Don't trust in the brook. Don't trust in the ravens. It's there, it was blessing you for a time, but there's a time that that may end. Trust in me. Don't trust in the gift. Trust in the giver, because I will be faithful. The Kareth Ravine will no longer meet your needs. I can imagine Elijah has grown pretty comfortable with the arrangement, and sometimes we can grow pretty comfortable where we are. We want to stay there. God wants something else. This summer, one of the things that we, will, we have found is that construction is happening everywhere. You've got to find reroutes. I mean, trying to figure out how to go down to Indian Lake or different places. I've got to go, okay, which road am I going to take? Because they keep, and, and I get frustrated at that. But then again, I'm thankful for that because I know they're getting the roads fixed. I hope they're getting the roads fixed. Um, and so also the Lord reroutes us. We don't like to be rerouted. We don't like traffic jams. We want to move. We, we're, we, everything seems great. We're making good progress. And then wham, we're at a traffic jam. We can't do, go anywhere. God's rerouting us. Now, don't trust in that. I will fa be faithful to you. Trust in me. Elijah might have been tempted to stay at the ravine and just pray for the ravens to come back and the water to return. He could have prayed all he wanted and he would have died there. If God's calling you to go somewhere, you can't just pray your way out of the situation you're in. We've got to follow his commands. Elijah had to follow his commands. He couldn't just sit there and say, okay, Lord, I'm just going to keep praying until you finally give in. Instead, he just he followed the command. So God had another plan, which is very interesting. God promised, and so he, he sends him to Zarephath. Go to Zarephath, and there's going to be a widow who will supply her needs. This sounds like a pretty good plan, right? I mean, it reminds me a little bit of different strokes. Remember that old story of uh, two poor inner-city black kids get adopted by some rich white guy? 
The problem is, uh, the widow isn't white and she isn't rich. <laughs> and so he shows up and she is destitute. She is on her last meal. And here Elijah, the man of God, is asking her to share her last crumb. After she tells him, I got nothing. I'm, me and my boy are going to go drink, eat the last, and we're going to die. He says, okay, but before you do that, before you go eat your last bread and die with your son, make me some bread first. That's what he says. Bring it to me. <laughs> thinking, what? I mean, who can ask that of someone? Who would dare ask a widow to do that? I'm afraid I might have struggled asking her to do that. I might have said, no, I can't take your last bread. You need to go. I, I would have been a great hospice counselor with her. Let me go sit by you while you eat your bread and die. Elijah didn't do that. Elijah understood his job is not to ask people uh, to do what was easy all the time. His job was not to provide hospice to people who were dying all the time. His primary job was to be in front of people and show them this is the real God. And prophets understood the most important thing is to present a holy God to the people and not to allow them to be comforted by a cheap imitation like Baal. Jesus called, take up your cross and follow me. That's what he said. You want to follow me, here's the pathway. It's not easy. It's going to cause sacrifice. It's going to be demanded of you. But when you lose your life, then you find it. The widow did what Elijah said, and guess what? They ate for the rest until the famine, until the drought was over. It saved her life. It saved her son's life. God sent Elijah to, to Sidon, to this home of uh, Sidon, the place of Jezebel, <laughs> to this widow where she had nothing to offer him. But her hospitality saved his life. And his relationship with her saved her life. Boy, that's a picture of the church, isn't it? Picture of the church. Different people from different places. God sends us to people that we look at and we say, yeah, they don't really have anything to offer me. <laughs> and this prophet comes and says, you've got to do what is seemingly possible. Yeah, I don't want to hear that message. But amazingly, they come together as a community and they are, they, they are nourished and fed and find life together. And so also do we. I love the movie Lord of the Rings. Um, and it's so much along with the story. The ring is this, it's really a picture of an idolatry. It's power. You get a hold of that ring and you can be powerful and you can be strong. And everyone is tempted to hold on to that ring. Everyone no one can be corrupted except Frodo. He's the only one that can't be corrupted by it. Even the, even the powerful who, who have good intentions, if they get the ring and they grip it, they will lose perspective. Boy, isn't that a picture of idolatry? Good things, good intentions, but we take them and we grip onto them and we make them ultimate and they corrupt us. But what happened in the Lord of the Rings is uh, Frodo agrees to take the evil ring to be destroyed. But the way he will do that, one by one, rulers of nations and people gather together to form this fellowship of the ring, commitment and willing to sacrifice for one another. And what a picture of the church. We are the church. We are called to live holy. We are at the intersection of the world. And being holy matters because God is revealing himself to the world, showing the world love. And we are called to come together and we surrender our idols to the only one who can deal with the idols, which is Christ himself. We come together, people who are very different. And we look at people and say, I don't think they have anything to offer to me. They're so different than me. They, they seem so poor. They don't, what are they going to do for me? We come together, not because of each other. We're so great or they're so great. We come together because we're called of God. That's it. 
We're special not because of who we are. We're called special because he's called us together. We're here today only because we're called by him. You're not coming to hear me preach. You're coming to God because he's called you. It's the only reason you're here. And we come together and form a community. And God does amazing things in our midst. He reveals to the world who he is through the way we love him and love one another. We are saved. Serving Baal is really about serving self. And we grip a hold of things, good things, beautiful things, and we just can't let go of them. Sometimes it takes a three-year drought before people can let go of things. Sometimes it, it takes that before we let go of it. it. Life just has to turn upside down a little bit before we can let go of things. We let go of that grip, and we're freed to love. When we're gripping, we overreact to things. You ever notice when you overreact to something? I mean, I've had that happen many times. Something happens, and I just overreact, and immediately the Lord says, what is in your heart that makes you respond that way? Because you know that's not the way you're supposed to respond. I know it's not the way I'm supposed to respond. I, I don't know what was in me that made me do that. What is in there? Lord, what am I gripping a hold of? Why am I so anxious about that? Something happens. I get so anxious. What's going on? What grip am I? What am I holding on to? What, what, what fear is there? What shame is there? Keller says the two things that create idols are those things that, where we hear applause of people and those things where we feel the shame of people. We take those two things and we make them into idols. We take the things that cause that. And either we're so afraid of something that's going to bring shame or we're so desiring something that brings applause and we turn them into idols. Paul says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Present your bodies as living sacrifices to God and he will transform us. Let's pray. Father, we don't want an imitation. We don't want to serve Baal. These unreliable gods. We don't want to worship created things rather than the creator who's to be greatly praised. You're the only one. You're the only one that can be counted on. You're the only one that offers eternal life. You're the only one that can fill the ache in our heart. You are the foundation of all being. You are the foundation of who we are. You created us. You love us. We let go of all idols. We release them to you. Something that's gripping us, something that's holding on to us, Lord, we let it go. Holy Spirit, identify what that is. Maybe you're rerouting us. Maybe we face some major construction project and the Lord is, is stopping us in our tracks and wanting us to go another way and we're having difficulty going that way. We want to surrender. We want to release that Lord to you. You will be there in the drought. You will be there when it seems like all the rivers are, are dried up. You may send us to someone that we think, boy, this person isn't going to help. But Lord, it's amazing what you do in community with one another. So, Father, help us to be your people as you establish us in the intersections of the world. May we be your priest. May we be holy in that you are first. Love the Lord our God and love our neighbor as ourselves. Cleanse us. Fire and wind blow through our lives. Cleanse us that we may be yours. And then you show us how to live. As we lose our life, we find our life. And we realize we are caught up in something so much bigger than just ourselves and the worship of Baal and our idols. We're caught up in your grand redemptive plans for creation. May we live that way. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. I'm going to end with this prayer that I, uh, John Whittier wrote this prayer and I use it every now and then uh, a lot. Well, pretty much every day lately. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways, reclothe us 
in our rightful mind, in purer lives thy service find, in deeper reverence praise. O Sabbath rest by Galilee, O calm of hills above, take from our lives the strain and stress, and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. May it be so. Amen. You're dismissed.